the most important sleep habit you can have is to get up around the same time every day and put your feet on the floor. We were just chatting. Sleep is something that's been so, so much of a focus for me and really came to the forefront as not just one of the more important, if not the most important things in my life, but also as one of the most anxiety producing aspects of my life, really tracing back to college. And I want to dig into that, but um, I just want to, I want to introduce you. I want to thank you so much for joining me because so many people are recognizing the importance of sleep, but in this conversation, we're actually going to outline why and how that matters. So um, yeah, thank you for, for joining me. Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. I love all opportunities to kind of spread the word of all the things you just talked about. So really looking forward to it. I know you have obviously your professional focus is sleep you also work with related modalities including cognitive therapy and, and so on and so forth can you give just a, a bit of background on uh the world that you come from and kind of what's what's brought you to this point in your career yeah so i have a, a clinical phd in or a, psych, a phd in clinical psychology and sometimes people right off the bat get confused as to why that would be the forum for insomnia treatment um, I think we've been conditioned and cultured to believe it's a, a medication-based solution. But if you think about it, you know, our health is really impacted by all our behaviors and our thoughts across the board, but sleep is particularly sensitive to our thoughts and behaviors. And we can talk about the science of why. Um, so clinical psychology is a perfect fit for it because that's where evidence-based treatment lies to kind of connect our thoughts, feelings, behaviors, physical symptoms, and those patterns. And, um, I was very into the mind body connection, Yeah. very into evidence-based medicine. So, uh, my interest started at, uh, Stanford and their, uh, sleep medicine department, of psychiatry and sleep medicine, which is, um, was really an honor and privilege to work with a lot of the clinicians there. I did helped with some research studies there and, uh, it really just laid the foundation where I fell in love with the evidence-based treatments that are embedded within sleep medicine. Yeah. And I have a history of poor sleep myself. So, and in my family. So, you know, there was a personal relevance to that as well. Uh, and then I continued on in my training to uh, get a PhD in that area. I love the intersection also between clinical treatments and research. I think we, we need to know how those two things interplay off each other. Um, and that was really key to me. So that's why I went that career path versus um, medicine or, you know, an MD or something like that. So um, I, I finished that at ASU. Uh, and since then have just been really immersed in researching, developing, implementing mm -hmm. evidence-based treatments and, and especially in the behavioral sleep medicine world. Yeah, and we're, we're gonna dig through all of that. Um, kind of, I guess, tracing back to, to the origins um, of sleep for, for individuals, for us as people, like, I guess, why is, why is sleep important? I know there's so many, there's books out there that try to address this topic. Um, in your words and based on your research, like what is the meaning? What is what is the importance of sleep in our lives? Yeah, so sleep, you know, even though our thoughts and behaviors have big influences like on our sleep quality uh, and quantity, when you look at the physiological mechanisms of sleep, so like what's happening in your brain and your body when we sleep, I think that's where you get to answer that question. So right. um, a lot of people get um, caught up on like needing more of a certain type of sleep, like REM or non-REM. But really, both are vital to our well-being. So, and both are associated with hormone release. Uh, certain types of hormones are released in deep sleep, like human growth hormone, testosterone. It's where we see our immune system repaired and kind of. So, it's it's a lot of restoration of what we do during the day. The restoration pieces for our body happens in that deep sleep. But then, when you move into REM, you see a lot of benefits to our concentration, our kind of mental processes, and those obviously are also important. So I think, you know, and that then ties into mood regulation and all that good stuff. So I think you can't operate during the day without your body undergoing those processes at night. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's the foundation of our health. Because if any of those sleep processes are off, especially chronically. I don't like to scare people and people freak out. You know, if they have one bad nights of sleep, all of this is going downhill. So, but um, I think we don't prioritize the nighttime. We try to pack everything into our daytime and maximize every minute of every day at the expense of our sleep, not thinking about 
what the consequences of that might be. So it, to answer your question simply, you know, it's the it's the time our body restores itself to do what you need to do the next day. Across the board, every physical process and every mental process is touched upon by sleep. I think I used to look at my sleep time as okay, I just went through 16 or 18 hours of my of my day work uh, fitness, you know, like working, everything that I do during my day and now I have to sleep. Mm-hmm. Now I have to have to jump in bed and, and try to get a little sleep. But now, since my experience in college with my roommates that really uh, awakened me to the value and the importance of sleep, um, but also my, my commitment to my wellness journey, I look at it differently. And it's very much more so of a, a privilege and an honor. And I actually, I think about sleeping as going into what I call the healing chamber. Um, oh, I like something- that. Yeah, I just kind of adopted that a few years ago because I think to your point, you know, that's that's the the right outlook that we need to c- kind of take into our sleep time. It's not something that we have to do. It shouldn't be an invasive an invasive part of life. It should be something that's just as important as, as what you do or, do during the day, right? Um, Absolutely. But to your point, that's a mindset. That's a yeah. thought. You know, like of how you think about your sleep is going to modify how you approach it and the time mm-hmm. and how stressed you are before you go to bed. If you're looking forward to it versus that it's getting in the way of your productivity or your daytime. So yeah. that I love that. I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna steal that from you. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, what is? What did you start to discover within your own life as you started to become more focused on sleep and the role that it played in your personal personal life and productivity and or just with your clients? Um, like what are some of those most common issues that that people tend to face yeah that's a great question i'll start personally and then extend you know some um experiences i've had as a clinician and uh, a lot of people ask you know they assume being a psychologist uh, is emotionally taxing um but i just learned so much from my clients and how resilient we are and how much more resilient we can be if we sleep well <laughs> so um personally you know you mentioned some sleep issues in college and there are some pivotal points um in our lives where i think our sleep shifts and col- entry to college uh and young adulthood you know is one of them uh for women pregnancy menopause retirement's another one you know so we see these big shifts so in my own life college was one it's where i really uh recognized how much of a night owl i was yeah. to the extent that it interfered with my ability to function during in the morning um and um you know luckily in college you can kind of pick and choose your schedule a little bit um so i I just kind of accommodated but then when i entered the workforce i got went to stanford i couldn't actually get to work on time uh because of that circadian issue yeah um luckily i was in the right place (laughs) so uh but i just really realized you know oh my gosh if you don't if you don't take care of yourself in your sleep like it could it actually interfered with my ability to be a functional um, you know, be functioning at, at work. And then as I had children, I have two girls. And when I went through kind of that postpartum process, um, obviously you're not in control of your sleep, uh, but I just realized how, how my mood was impacted during the daytime. And I wasn't, you know, if I didn't start prioritizing myself and, um, my, my sleep and my self care, I wasn't going to be able to be the mother that I wanted to be. Um, so, and now, you know, I'm kind of like, like you where, like sleep is is probably number two in my life. My family's number one. Sleep is number two. But if I don't do number two, I can't do number one. <laughs> so those are probably one A, one B. Yeah. Um, and then comes other things in my life. So um, it really, for myself, if I use the right strategies to make sure I have the right amount of sleep and get my, my mindset and my body in the right state before sleep, yeah. um, then things are I can do so much more uh, with my life for the things that really matter. For um, for clients, what I've noticed, you know, some, a lot of people come to me for sleep, obviously, but there's a big bucket of really high achieving, um, really amazing people who are either really anxious or have really low mood, where that mood issue will resolve if they sleep well. And so I think some people keep pushing themselves, pushing themselves, thinking, what are what am I doing wrong? How can I do better during the day? You know, and they're not paying attention to that sleep issue. So even when people come to me for other things, because I do evidence-based treatments for all sorts of things, you know, trauma, um, depression, anxiety, um, self-esteem, that, you know, we check on that. Yes. You know, so especially a lot of working professionals or busy parents, they'll stay up till two o'clock in the morning, folding laundry, getting that last bit of emails out, and, and then not recognizing, again, like kind of where we started, what expense that has to them. Um, so really just teaching the priority of sleep, which is why, 
you know, I've considered moving more into a coaching space than just psychotherapy because people have some stigma of like getting mental health treatment, but anyone can benefit from education and some simple strategies on how to check in and prioritize your, your sleep and, and make it better on your own in a couple, you know, just with a little bit of education, you don't need to go to therapy for that. So I've, it's really expanded my mind on how else can I reach more people and help more people understand these things. There, there is a pervasive mentality in this so-called hustle culture that I've been sort of wrapped up in, I would say the last like two years of my life, but I'm just now kind of starting to bob my head above water and realize some of, some of the good parts and the, the potentially harmful parts of this obsessiveness with productivity and with work um, and prioritizing and sacrificing um, that, you know, for other aspects of life such as sleep probably being the at the forefront there you know I've, I've always identified as being a night out like i've always like you said um i don't know when that started honestly when i was younger i just realized that i was more creative more thoughtful and more um more productive at night and even up until recently i had no problem staying up until two three or four in the morning you know just yeah. reading yeah. working yeah. writing journaling whatever but it came at the cost of of you know some sleep on on the front end um what are some of the i guess risks right that people face when sort of just getting not getting enough sleep i guess right like you're only getting five or six hours you're maybe staying up way too late at night and waking up at a semi-normal time in the morning like what's the effect of that long term it depends on the person, which I know is kind of a, a vague answer, but because sleep is a very individual need, uh, the average amount of sleep that a, a, an adult needs, 18 to 64, is six to 10 hours. And so, you know, we do have a kind of an eight myth in our culture. There's nothing special about it, but it is the middle of that. It's the average of that range. So for someone that's sleeping six hours, but that's their, that meets their sleep need. And it's within the right sleep window. So ideally the scientific, you know, the clinical recommendation for night owls like you and me is actually, if we can flow with that. So ideally, if I could sleep from uh, three to 10 right. or three to, to nine, six or seven hours of sleep is kind of where I'm at. Yeah. That would be great for me. My problem is, and I would function very, very well. My problem is, is that the world and the job that I have right. isn't aligned with that. So I have to find ways to adjust. So I, that's kind of the beauty of, of working with a clinician is you find that amount of sleep that you need and the timing of that sleep window. Cause that there are genetic influences that have differences in that. It's not, you know, it, not everyone has to go to bed at 10 and wake up at six. And so, so through using data and um, sleep diaries, you know, that's, that's generally what I help people find. Cause I find people trying to get eight hours from, you know, nine to five, you know, enforcing a window or a quantity that's not aligned with their genetic predisposition. So, so if we are trying to get the wrong amount of sleep in the wrong window, the consequences, you know, are kind of as widespread as what I mentioned the benefits are. So you might notice mood issues over time, lack of concentration, irritability. What I find is people are just not as happy and productive. Or I won't even use the word happy because I have issues. You know, we, can, we, we can't be happy all the time. They just can't be as as neutral and satisfied right. they're more they're more swayed and finding themselves in pits of stress and urgency and you know their life is led uh by more negative slanting emotions than consistency calm and positive things is what i generally find and you know there are things you know in the health realms in terms of we're gonna feel chronic pain a little bit more intensely if you're prone to migraines you might get more clothes you know so there's that physical component too but the real magic is finding the window and the time that aligns with your natural circadian rhythm. Everyone has their own. It usually ranges between 22 and 24 hours. And then working with that. Is it normal to feel super groggy and like almost, I don't want to say in pain, but just completely like out of it when you wake up in the morning? Cause I've been that way for like my entire life. And I don't know if that's normal or not. It, it is for people that have that night owl circadian tendency. That's why I was unable to get up and function at yeah. work. People who are, and then you have people who are larks who can't stay awake past five or six and they're up at like three or four, but they're going to be to work on time, right? So we see less of that clinically because they find ways to make it work. So is that normal? For some, 
you know, some people, it, but it is for me too. And so what it really comes down to is me having a pretty structured morning routine with light exposure mm -hmm. and not hitting um, the snooze button. We can talk more about why those things work scientifically. Yes. And, and also kind of coming to an acceptance that I'm not going to wake up bouncing out of bed. If I keep searching for that, I'm going to keep getting frustrated and mad at myself over something that might just not be possible, you know, <laughs> um, because because of my genetics and my circadian tendencies. So, you know, it's all about learning about yourself and, mm -hmm. and then again, working with it, you know, so that I'm not mad at myself every morning. I'm 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 compassionate. I do my my structure. A routine to help me have the best day possible. And I know that I'm not really perky till about 10 a.m. So if I've got big meetings, big presentations, you know, I, I tend to not put them in those time slots, you know, and things like that. So kind of working with myself instead of against myself. Do you, um, do you drink caffeine in the morning? And then conversely, is there a time at during the afternoon or evening when you suggest that people do not drink caffeine after? Yeah, caffeine, you know, talking, I love uh, the term hustle culture. Uh, I saw a quote, uh, and I feel bad because I'm not going to be able to attribute it correctly, um, that, you know, we drink so much caffeine to cope with the world that we've built um, that requires caffeine, you know, and caffeine's not bad. And for things like night owl circadian tendencies, you know, there can actually be um, some ways to dose that or work with it to help you. But like all things, there are pros and cons. So the general scientific recommendations are your body has mechanisms and hormones that it releases to help you feel sleepy and awake. So if you, if you align your caffeine intake to not fight that, it's not, it's not so bad. So for example, your body has a natural cortisol peak at about 45 minutes after you wake up. Um, if you want your caffeine to feel most effective, generally don't recommend drinking it until you've been awake for about an hour. Um, and then you want to stop drinking caffeine about eight to 10 hours before you go to bed because caffeine has a crazy half-life. And so it's, at, it's half-life is four to five hours, right. but it's not completely out of your system until eight to 10 hours. So I usually tell people don't drink it for the first hour, then have some and don't have more than 400 milligrams, which is usually two to three servings, but check bottle some of these energy drinks and stuff will whack it all into one <laughs> one serving or one big you know it depends on the size of your coffee etc yeah usually by 2 or 3 p.m we don't want to be having anymore yep yep totally and so many people don't abide by that whatsoever i know people that um maybe not so much anymore with the remote work that a lot of people have shifted into but when i was going into the office people would have five or six cups of coffee like it was nothing all the way up till 5 p.m and i'm just like doesn't that keep you awake all night? But <laughs> I guess you get so used to it, right? And it starts yeah. messing with the stones. You, you, can, you can develop a tolerance to it. There are some people that are just more sensitive to it than others, going back to like know yourself, you know, but um, a lot of times that that half-life mark of four to five hours as the caffeine, the, bit, the bulk of it wears off, you get this burst of adenosine, our sleepy hormone, and you have that caffeine crash. And that's when people are like, oh crap, I need more caffeine. And that's the pattern that we kind of don't want to get into. So um, do I drink caffeine? Yes, I do. I do. But I, I keep well within those limits because I'm more sensitive to mm -hmm. it. Um, and because I'm a night owl and because I am more creative and get going in the night, I need to protect that two hours before bed really, really carefully that I'm not having caffeine in my system. I'm not super activate, you know, active or engaging in work. So I'll just keep going, 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 you know? And so it's all about pers you know, individual, but most generally people shouldn't be drinking caffeine into the afternoon and evening. I saw a quote once that really resonated to the effect of we drink caffeine in the morning to wake us up. We drink alcohol at night to numb, numb our pain or numb us from the day. Then we wake up and we do it all over again. Um, which speaks to the maybe the the uh, pessimistic aspects of just the way that our societies become. Um, I'm not sure, but you know, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And when it comes to alcohol, I mean, something that is so destructive to sleep. Can you talk a little bit about what what alcohol does in terms of our ability to to get or to maintain quality sleep? Absolutely. Before we go into that, I, I, I want to reflect on that comment you just shared, yeah. um, because not only does it reflect the culture that we've um, built, but I, I think it really hones in on this. I have to have something outside of myself to make myself move and make myself sleep. I can't do it on my own. I have to have a substance. And if you look at most of the, you know, as seen on TV products or things, it's all about quick fixes. And sleep is not a quick fix. Sleep is a regular routine, just like exercise or weight loss. You know, there's most things in having optimal health are not quick fixes. And anything that tries to tell you different, even to the extent of melatonin, 
is not, and, and medications for sleep, which we can or, or can't talk about, it is not, has no evidence, no research. We're very, you know, to support long-term sleep sustainment health. So, um, and in fact, a lot of them interfere with getting the deep quality sleep that we need that I talked about that's associated with hormone release and tissue repair and immune system. So alcohol is also like a drug, right? And so um, it's a it's a particularly slippery slope because like you said, it's a sedative, you know, it's a depressant. It makes you feel like a little relaxed and even sleepy. So it's a really easy thing for people to get caught into thinking, of course, this helps me sleep. Uh, but what happens is it actually totally junks up and messes up the second half of your night when you're getting um, uh, your REM sleep. Your sleep cycles don't progress as they normally would. Okay. And so you don't get the same amount and quality of your sleep cycles. And so you wake up feeling more junky. It's kind of part of that hangover effect. So you don't yeah. get it. And it, it often creates fragmentation or awakenings in that second half of the night. So, um, and whatever you're getting from that nightcap effect, usually our body builds a physiological tolerance to that in about a couple days. So you're always going to need more. So, it, and my big thing is people do have the ability to make themselves, to help themselves sleep and to get up and do what they need to do without the use of substances, but we have to, that's a completely counterculture and counter industry perspective. Right. Um, but everything in, in cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is really teaching those skills and finding that sleep window that works for you. Um, so yeah, the alcohol is a real, a real tricky one. There's absolutely no benefit to your, your sleep cycles and, um, and, you know, also important to know, because it is a, a depressant, you know, if you're taking other medications or if you have untreated sleep apnea, mm -hmm. um, it can make those things worse. If you're taking things like an antidepressant, it can help mitigate the effects of the other things you might be trying to do for your health. So um, it's a it's a it's a doozy. I was thinking about, you know, this conversation over the last couple of days, and one of the things that kind of popped out to me is sleep habits and we can even we can either have good sleep habits or we can have non-beneficial sleep habits and i think they're sort of quietly one of the mo most difficult types of habits to either set or break um, at least for me and honestly i'd never realized some of the habits that had kind of crept up on me that i've just really sunk into like the last like half decade of my life for example I don't know how not to fall asleep if I'm not on my stomach. And the downside of that is that my head is turned and I've developed like a chronic kink in my neck and in my back due to that. But like now I don't know how to fix that. And I've tried recently to, you know, fall asleep on my side. I can't fall asleep on my back. I just can't do it. Maybe I'm saying that and that's why maybe I need to actually change my dialogue, but that's there. And then if there's light, if there's any light seepage, I, I can't do it. If there's any noise, I can't do it. So. I'm wearing earplugs every night. Like, I just feel like I go into this little slumber and that's the way that I've maybe conditioned myself to need to sleep. But what are your thoughts around um, sleep habits and really setting setting up positive behaviors to enable better sleep? I always tell people they're necessary, but not sufficient. So it is important to have a, a really important, um, you know, what would fall under the term sleep hygiene, which I, I hate. It makes us sound like dirty sleepers if we don't do them. But so I call them sleep health behaviors. Um, and it is important to have a series of, you know, a, a routine of those. So, like I use a white noise machine, you use, you use earplugs, you know, we have blackout drapes or, you know, we make sure those are all really important. If you have insomnia or a clinical sleep disorder, it will not bring you all the way home. So sometimes people actually get frustrated. because so they're like, I'm doing all the things, you know, and, and that's where CBTI really comes in that we might need to look at the, the timing of your sleep and some of the other things in terms of mindset or that we do to, you know, kind of work on, on sleep. And again, finding that kind of personalized sweet spot, um, sleep positioning, you know, it, it's, if you don't have sleep apnea and it doesn't matter, like you said, there might be uh, unintended consequences like a neck, you know, kink and things like that for that. You know, I'd say try to, you know, manipulate the pillow or, you know, the other aspects of your sleep environment versus forcing another sleep position. You're probably going to, that's going to be harder, you know, and it's okay to be a stomach sleeper. There's not something bad with that, but you want to find other things that help, help you do that without having pain the next day, you know, or are there stretches that are recommended to do as soon as you wake up, you know, or whatever the, that might look like to, um, but so, you know, sleep positioning is, is generally just a personal preference. Um, so I think those things are important. They're very individualized. I, ge I generally tell people to really consider temperature, noise, and light as our primary 
environmental factors. So if it's too hot or too cold, um, but that's a trouble for, for you and me in Arizona, because like the optimal sleep temperature is like around 65. And I don't know about you, but I'm not paying the AC bill in the summer to make that happen. <laughs> so, so working with fans and you brought up sleep as a privilege and, and that is true. You know, some of the, there's a lot of parameters in people's lives where they can't afford or don't have these things to work with. So thinking about accessible sleep solutions and I think are really important too. Um, noise level, um, either a white noise machine or earplugs. Sometimes earplugs make people have anxiety that they're gonna miss something or they can't hear something. So the white noise machine's a little bit better um, and there are free apps to experiment with that. Um, so, um, and then the light is really, really important. So yeah, I definitely advocate for blackout drapes or whatever you need because the less light, the better. Yes, definitely. I wanted to ask you about, you, you mentioned anxiety, but uh, hyperactivity, hypersensitivity with, with the brain. Um, why does that happen to some people sometimes when they're trying to fall asleep where you feel like you just can't release, you feel like you can't let go, like there's something that's electrocuted or something like within your brain that won't shut off. Why does that yeah. happen? How do, how do we fix that? Yeah, yeah. And I just realized before we move on to that, the most important sleep habit you can have is to get up around the same time every day and put your feet on the floor and get some light exposure. So aside, that will always be more powerful than, you know, any any gadgets and things like that. So I did wanted to do my scientific disclaimer on that. Great. Um, to answer your question about overactive mind. Uh, it can happen for a couple different reasons. One can be, again, that genetic predisposition. If you're a night owl, like your mind just be, might be ready to go, you know, at that time. Oftentimes what happens to people because of our hustle culture and we're focused on all these other things, we kind of backlog and shove to the back, maybe some stresses we have in our lives, some things that happened that day that we need to process out, maybe some things like, oh crap, I forgot the dry cleaning, you know, or I need to get some more something at the store. So it doesn't have to be um, a major issue, but it can be. And so as your body's relaxing, so you have your body has a relaxation system and your sleep system, you know, it'll secrete melatonin at the right time, your muscle tone will be going down. But let's say you haven't attended to those things. Your mind's gonna be like, oh, here's my opportunity, you know, and kind of throw those things into the forefront. Your stresses, your worries, your not to do's, um, because it's the first opportunity it's had all day as you're starting to relax and unwind. So one strategy, you know, we really try to work with people on is having some time set aside in your day, a couple hours before sleep to do either a daily wrap up, a check in, look at your to do list. It can be very logistical, you know, and kind of close out your day. But it can also be more emotional, like some journaling, some reflection. I call them like self check ins, you know, and how do we have a self check in process on what did I do well today? What, you know, can I um, you know, what do I need to keep working on? What's, what's bugging me, you know, and try to get those things down. So it's less sleep interfering. So I think those are the main reasons that we have that kind of overactive. And the third thing I would say is if we've just been doing that for a long time, our minds become conditioned. Yeah. This is the time I worry. This is the time I think, because I've done it for the past couple of years. And so it just becomes a unintentional conditioned habit right. that will just keep repeating and so that's why when we do something like worry time or have structured exercises at other times even if we're not feeling worried it reconditions our brain to have to undergo those those steps at a different time that won't interfere with our sleep and then piggybacking off of that are there any um are there any like almost like tactical or technical things that you try to do each day before going to sleep and then when waking up like is there a specific time you say no more blue light after this time yeah uh, so for myself personally i don't find that i'm super influenced by blue light you know so i but i do put my phone on the charger way away from my bed i still use it as my alarm clock but it is not in arm's reach at least 30 to 45 minutes before i go to bed Okay. Um, I make my, I have an 11 year old and uh, she went to middle school and against, uh, you know, since they don't have pay phones, we got her a phone. Uh, and it's been really interesting to try to teach good technology habits at that age. Uh, so the routine is, you know, the phone's out of the bedroom and off the charge, you know, in the charger in a different room by, you know, an hour before bed. I don't like starting my day glued to my phone, either putting it down or picking it up. Yeah. Um, I don't know how sleep interfering it is versus like, I just want to feel like I'm, I'm controlling my day uh, and starting and ending the day on my terms. And when I'm on my phone, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, I just, it's not bad, but I scroll through useless crap, you know, <laughs> and sometimes even stuff that makes me upset or I get just like in a rabbit hole that's interesting to me. Yeah. 
but it's not always aligned with what I need to do with my life. And what I, what I do to say my day's been successful or not successful. And yes. so uh, it's, it's as much a mindset thing as a uh, sleep thing. I also start my day without fail with like writing down my priorities and what are the actions I'm going to do to meet those priorities. So even as, as little as, you know, my kids are my priority. So I make sure to do like a bedtime check-in with them. Yeah. Um, I always do some deep breathing before I go to bed. Um, and having some some structure in that way. So kind of a long-winded answer, but um, those are the things, aside from the blue light science, which is very strong and I do very believe in, it's kind of that that approach to my life on how I want to control my outcomes and uh, my productivity that I think, uh, which ultimately makes me feel more relaxed before I go to bed because I'm owning my own narrative throughout the day. And also in the morning, just having the presence of mind to kind of take control, conscious yeah. control of yeah. your actions and your thoughts in the morning as much as possible will have residual effects when you lay down and go to sleep that night. So thank you for pointing that out. Exactly. Um, I've got kind of an out of left field question for you yeah. related to dreams. I'm curious if dream therapy and or just a, a, a focus on, on dreaming and dream analysis is something that you think about in your work or personally and how dreams kind of play into your um, approach to sleep, if at all? Yeah, it is a great question. People ask me that all the time and I have a really disappointing answer. <laughs> no. So, you know, in as much as if we're having a lot of dream content, mm -hmm. it, it may reflect that we're stressed and we're in lighter stages of sleep more of the night and thus remembering them or getting awoken by them. And so I think they're significant in that way. Uh, when when I do uh, I do do therapy for nightmares, um, and when we do that, you know, part of it is um, just stress management during the daytime because you know if we're more stressed and more activated, and our arousal system it can over. So our arousal system is like our cortisol, our adrenaline. If we don't allow our sleep cycle to kind of uh, do its job, and the arousal system's dictating it, we're more likely to wake up a lot during the night, remember that dream content. So from that perspective, you know, I think of dreams uh, as an important indicator of stress. In terms of digging into dream content as a way to give us information about our lives, it might just be that I'm such a science nerd that the science is not, doesn't go there as much. It's not as powerful. And so I don't know as much about it. I mean, so it's possible that it's a great thing that just hasn't been part of my science-based training. Yeah. But usually, you know, it, um, I know there are people out there that have said really amazing things about it, um, but it, it, it falls for my background and training more into like old school Freudian stuff and not aligned with evidence based analysis of like sleep patterns. We don't need to do that. You know, if we manage stress and we're in bed for the right amount of time and getting the right quality and quantity of sleep. Um, and there's just also individual variation on how much people remember their dreams, you know, so it's not, it's not always a, a meaningful indicator you know, for people. Sure. sure. And I, I definitely want to leave a few minutes here at the end to kind of go beyond sleep and talk about CBT and some of the other um, facets of your work. But before we do, um, are there any kind of uh, just big takeaways or some of the, the most important, I guess, one to two things that you want people to think about around sleep? Yeah, lean into it. Just don't take it for granted and assume it's not part of an answer for you, you know, and, and um, addressing sleep issues are, are relatively simpler uh, compared that than I think people think. It does require a motivation and, and diligence and consistency to address on a day to day basis. You know, I don't I don't do any uh, magic wand therapy, you know, what I'm but but um, it's easier than we think. Look into it. Don't be afraid to work with either a therapist or, you know, I, I want to start offering, like I said, you know, just more like coaching level, like available to the masses type things to look into that. Uh, from a very structural time point, what would I tell everyone to go do different tomorrow? Wake up at the same time and get some light in your eyes. That's what actually houses our circadian rhythm and sleep is the super, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is where the two optic nerves cross over. And that dictates when your body will secrete sleep and awake hormones. And so everyone tries to control their sleep with the nighttime. You control your sleep by the morning, by having a consistent wake time that you sit up and get some light input. Now you don't have to be running a marathon and super healthy. You know, you can be slouched over in your bed or, you know, um, and if you need to get a light, light therapy, uh, a therapy lamp for like the time of year that we're, that we're in now where there isn't natural light in the morning, that's awesome. But uh, experiment with that. People will be surprised what they find. 
Yeah, and one thing I want to add into just from personal experience is like try not to beat yourself up right on the micro. So if you miss one night or you you end up staying up till three, like I still do some nights, it can be really tempting to to blame yourself, especially in the morning when you're exhausted and you've got to wake up for work. Um, but we have to find a way not to do that, but also to recognize, hey, like we do need to set more healthy patterns and almost um, hold ourselves accountable over the course of weeks or months to get back on schedule. So. I've just been focusing on going to sleep like a half hour early and and really holding myself accountable to that. If I do find that I stay up really late one night, I'm like, all right, I'm not going to sleep past two the next couple nights and then I'll move it back to one and then I'll move back to midnight. And within a week or two, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna get back on schedule. So. Yeah, and I think we delude ourselves if we think we can be the same amount of consistency every day, even if we know consistency is the answer, right? So this is the human element that you're bringing up that I think is so important. That's with all approach to our lives. Go for the the meta macro change. Agreed. Give yourself a day of imperfection here and there. Give yourself because life requires it. Yeah. That's just not how human beings are built. Humans stink at doing things consistently. So yeah. why could you expect yourself to be the same every day? It's not how this works. So I think that's so, so important because what happens is if we start think believing that that one mistake screwed us over, we won't get back. We just are like, forget it, you know, and kind of dwell on that versus out of the 10 nights, if you hit your goals, I'm an 80, 20 person, you know, in all things in my life, because if I'm a 90, 10 or hundred zero, then I'm mad at myself way too often, you know? So hit, try to hit your goals 70 to 80% of the time. Once you set a goal, do it one more time than you did it last week. That's an improvement. You're also not going to go from zero to hundred when you're trying to change your sleep. I love what you said, like changing it a half hour, 15 minutes, do it achievable, scale up. Don't go to the extreme and then expect yourself to stay there. That's not how human behavior works. And just to throw this in by the same token, I mean, it's easier for things to start slipping out of control, right? If you allow it to happen and you can't make up sleep. I've always heard that too. Yeah. You can't make up for lost sleep if you get three hours one night, you can't just expect to sleep for 14 hours the next day and make up for it. It's not going to happen. Yeah, you don't, it doesn't generally consistently work the way you, you'd want that to. Right. <laughs> um, cool. So kind of extrapolating from, from this point um, to some of the other areas of focus for you, I know you work with, with anxiety and stress and a couple other um, modalities too. And I know that you, you've done a lot of work at the VA working with, with veterans. I'm curious, um, particularly around some of the PTSD patients that, that you've worked with, if you're open to sharing, um, I, I guess, what are some of the more common things that you're seeing um, in that field and working in that way? Yeah, and I do a lot of trauma work in my private practice too. Um, Evidence-based treatment for trauma is, is hard to find. Um, and there's, um, you know, it, it needs a specific protocol. So we do see different sleep patterns with different things. And um, what I notice with trauma, so with anxiety, we you have more trouble falling asleep. With depression, you have more, um, you know, you might be in bed too long or more trouble in the early morning. PTSD, you know, we notice that people have trouble falling asleep. Uh, a lot of times they're concerned with safety or, you know, some hypervigilance of noises and then the nightmares. What I notice across all, so with trauma especially, people wait too long. They wait till they're so, they've had so much functional impairment in their lives. Their relationships are broken. They're having trouble holding on to their jobs, you know, because it's so uncomfortable to talk about whatever happened that's driving that PTSD. I think there's also a lot of misconceptions on what PTSD is and isn't. We use the word trauma and PTSD, I think a little bit too loosely sometimes. Um, but trauma and having PTSD means that you've had a life experience in which you witnessed someone else's life or your own life being threatened yeah. um, or, you know, someone, someone passed away or, you know, something really, really magnitude. So, um, you know, it doesn't, it does not minimize other horrible things that happen in our lives, but there are pretty specific life events that meet that criteria of trauma. Uh, and so because they're so significant and because they're so uncomfortable, and because we have way too much mental health stigma in this country still it's getting better millennia and younger generations are doing so much better um but i've literally worked with people who haven't said a word about these thoughts and feelings for decades and that just breaks my heart because there's a trail of lost memories and opportunities and relationships in that wake that didn't have to you know that might have not had to be there because all of these things trauma depression anxiety have treatments 
that can be beneficial, both in the therapy realm. And this is a place that medications can be helpful. And when we notice that things have been chronic, severe, you know, uh, medications plus therapy mm -hmm. are usually the right types of medications, uh, you know, antidepressants generally, um, can get us back to a, a place in our lives where we can engage and enjoy things more. And so I just get really sad when I see people unable to move forward. I totally get why I'm not victim blaming or shaming by any, by any means. Uh, so I hope we move forward to a future that when these things happen in our lives, we talk about them sooner. Processing and talking about it earlier can actually prevent the development. Mm -hmm. And really, a, a lot of people can have these things happen and not develop PTSD. You know, so kind of there's lots of different tracks that can go. But we know if people talk about these things earlier, um, that it's less likely to develop. Just like if you have a bad infection, if you go to the doctor up front and start some antibiotics versus if you go several weeks later, you're dealing with different outcomes. Same mm -hmm. thing with our emotional health. My, my main area of practice um, in hospitals has actually been in brief treatments in primary care. So if you're feeling kind of bummed for a couple of weeks, let's talk about it. Let's take care of it now. Let's do a couple 30 minute sessions versus on the back end when it's been going on for years. And now we're doing months of hour long intensive treatment. So um, those would be my messages along both trauma for sure, but also with depression and anxiety. Is it hard for you as, as a therapist and as a doctor to sit down with people um how do you how do you shift your approach when you're working with someone who's so far down one line so far gone potentially due to what they've dealt with and and then not dealt with for decades like you said versus somebody who's just coming to you for sleep therapy like a working professional that just wants to um you know get back in in shape i think my approach is is the same it's just the amount of time that we need to spend working on it. So my approach is, is normalization on both ends. I totally understand why people are in boats that it's taken a long time for it. And in some ways, some of these treatments weren't even available. And the mental health stigma was layered. You know, I think about our Vietnam veterans and they didn't have any acceptance and offers of help. And so you totally get why people are where they're at. So I think um, compassion, normalization, education, and warmth. So, um, and meeting the people where they're at. So if I would say what I would change my approach, the strategies and the placement of evidence-based tools is going to be different for someone. So I really try to customize where the person's at with their symptoms. Someone who's been dealing with some um, stressors for a couple months, you know, we might have like a couple things that we're going to work on simultaneously. Whereas someone who's been dealing with someone for, with something for decades, we might just take some time to get to know each other and spend some time just learning how to sit with the discomfort. You know what I mean? And then we move into skills and then we move into things like that. So I think the pace is for sure different, but in terms of my approach, you know, I generally believe people are doing the best they can with what they got, totally. what they got is different. And my job is to figure out what they got, where they're at and go there yep. and um, just be as, um, I think we all have the potential to improve and to, and to get better. And so I just try to be that, that source of hope um, and that source of openness and transparency. We don't have a lot of spaces in our lives. We can just go be ourselves and, and show the ugly and not feel judged and not feel like someone's critiquing. Mm -hmm. And I, um, what I work the hardest at is to provide that. Yeah, for sure. So we've talked about tech, we've talked about sleep, we've talked about stress and anxiety um, during this conversation. I guess my last question, last topic for you, um, are there any sort of like big trends that you're seeing that span across either one or, or all of these these topics um, coming to the forefront within society that you want people to be thinking about or that you're kind of adamantly focused on going forward with your work? Yeah, that's a great question. Usually I'm able to answer right off the cuff, but I'm going to uh, think on that for a second. I think there are two. One is the accessibility of treatment. So uh, well, let, let's take CBTI, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. We do not have enough clinicians that are trained in that comparative to the number of people that have sleep problems, you know, and, and so access is hard. Price point is hard. Insurance coverage is hard. Yeah. I think there have been such amazing developments in the accessibility of telehealth, um, in licensure laws that now allow some psychology or psychologists to be cross licensed through site. It's called SciPact, you know, so I could deliver telehealth to someone in some other States. Um, I think, 
evidence-based treatments being able to be delivered on some um, app platforms. It's not, you know, there's not one size fits all. You know, I think it's really cool. I think we need to have some sources of, of truth and research to kind of help people know what's good and what's not good, you know, and, but now with social media and uh, with some app development, and um, I think psychologists are being more sought after for consultation, like they're, we're getting the word out more. Yes. So I would say if you've had issues in the, even in two years ago, and you felt like you, there wasn't a good fit, there might be now. Um, you know, I'll just plug one, like Insomnia Coach is a free app that you can download that was developed by VA and DOD and has, it gives all the elements of CBTI. It creates your own sleep schedule. It has an, an AI algorithm. It'll give you the skills. It's it, it's what I do, but delivered in a self-paced platform. Now it doesn't have the accountability and it doesn't have, you know, a clinician checking in on it, but it's a great first step of care. It's totally free. And so there are things like that that I think are phenomenal. The second trend that I think is really emerging um, is the digital tech, um, kind of the monetization of sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that has a couple different directions. Um, so take like Fitbits, Whoops, Aura Rings, you know, things that are that are trying to collate your physiological processes and aggregate them into usable data for you. I love it. But here's the problem. People don't know what that means. People don't know what it, you know, and, and there are some fundamental errors that I struggle with. So I have a Fitbit. A Fitbit cannot, you know, a, a wrist device cannot tell you if you're in deep sleep or not. It just can't. You need, you need little electrodes on your noggin. You know? So so I don't want people to get hung up on it and obsessed. There's actually a term orthosan. Like, I don't want people becoming obsessed with these tech devices, telling them whether they're sleeping well or not. There's error. Go with how you feel. Don't lose your gut and use that data to transform into behavioral action on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I think we need more resources helping people navigating that. Last question, I promise, just something oh. you said reminded me of this, um, this question that I had. I've been thinking a lot about the the tech age that we're coming into. Yeah. Obviously sleep is literally a physiological, biological human need. Like we need our sleep. There's no debate about that. But do you see a potential future where that could be changed or even eliminated as things like the metaverse which we don't even know what it's going to be um or the implications of that are coming to fruition or ai do you do you see a future where sleep may not be needed i don't okay i don't if you look at the um physiology of sleep and sleep through the ages you know there have been some sleep trends where people are sleeping less but you also see trends that mental health issues are increasing what right. does that mean for us you know so I, for me, I see things like uh, virtual reality, AI, I think helping create atmospheres and environments for people to do like relaxation before bed. You know, do I think it could help with sleep? Yeah. Do I think there's anything that can replace sleep or help us get along more without it? No, because on my military work experience on things, we've been trying to do that. We try to give Ambien, caffeine, this, that, the other, and it's not working. <laughs> and so I, I, I don't know that other devices and and advances could ever supplant. I mean, we don't know the body and the mind as well as we think we do, or we'd have a better handle on chronic disease management. And so I think we need to be very humble when it comes to the body and respect what it does and respect what it can't do and respect our knowledge of that in our in the interventions that we plan moving forward.